Hey, so good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Sebastian Beswick. Uh, I work at Art Processes as an iOS developer. Uh, now, Art Processes create uh, bespoke experiences for uh, uh, museums and cultural in institutions, uh, usually in the form of um, apps or something like them. So today we're going to be looking at how we can generate uh, a simple sound synthesizer um, that generates sound from scratch uh, using iOS. Uh, so let's take a quick second to look at what we're going to cover today. Uh, so first off, we're going to take a look at what physical sound actually is uh, and how we perceive it as people. Uh, then we're going to look at the differences between analog and digital sounds. Uh, we'll take a look at digital audio formats and how we can represent sound within a computer. Uh, then we'll go on and look at how we can use this knowledge to synthesize our own sounds and audio from scratch. Uh, we'll take a look at the iOS audio APIs uh, and finish with a quick demo of a simple sound synthesizer in Xcode. Uh, now, because I've only got a, a pretty short amount of time today, I'm going to be doing I'm going to be doing quite a lot of hand waving. Uh, so please feel free to grab me afterwards uh, if you've got questions on any specifics. So before we can actually look at uh, how sorry before we can talk about how sound is represented within a computer uh, and how we can synthesize it. Uh, let's take a look at what physical sounds actually are. So a sound is a sequence of waves of pressure propagating through a medium, which is usually air, uh, and we can think of these as vibrations. Now there are three key components that we use to uh, quantify sounds in the real world. The first of these components is a thing called pitch. Now the pitch of a musical note uh, is essentially governed by the frequency at which its sound wave oscillates. Um, so that is the speed at which the pressure fluctuations are occurring from high to low. Uh, a faster vibration is generally perceived as a higher pitch, and a slower vibration is perceived as a, lo as a uh, lower pitch. Uh, so here's a sound playing at a low pitch, <coughs> and here's one at a high pitch. Uh, now we measure frequency in hertz, or oscillations per second, and as people uh, we can generally perceive vibrations from about 20 hertz to about 20 kilohertz as sound. Uh, the second key aspect of sound is a thing called amplitude. So going back to our wave description of sound, uh, the amplitude of a sound is essentially uh, the degree of change from high pressure to low pressure. Um, we can think of the amplitude of a sound as being its loudness or its volume. Uh, and this is essentially governed by how much energy went into uh, creating the sound. <coughs> so we've seen that um, two of the very important defining characteristics of sound are its pitch and its amplitude. So whether it's high or low, and whether it's loud or soft. Uh, I'm going to play three sounds now. Uh, you're going to be able to tell that they're playing at the same pitch and the same amplitude, but they all sound quite distinct. <coughs> so what's the difference between these three sounds? Uh, the difference is a thing called timbre. And here's my favourite uh, tongue-in-cheek definition of timbre. So a sound's timbre is uh, essentially a thing that allows us to quantify the difference between two sounds uh, when the sounds have identical pitch and amplitude. Sometimes you'll hear uh, timbre referred to as tone colour. Uh, we can break a sound's timbre down into two basic physical properties, uh, its harmonic content or its spectrum uh, and its amplitude envelope. Um, so looking at spectrum, um, even though most musical sounds have, uh, as a general rule, a well-defined pitch, uh, that's not the only thing that's going on. Uh, most sounds actually contain multiple frequencies sounding simultaneously. Um, and as a general rule, it's the lowest frequency present in the sound, which is also usually the loudest uh, that we hear as a sound's pitch. Um, as additional higher frequencies are introduced alongside that fundamental frequency, often quieter, uh, the sound's timbre or its tone colour changes, uh, even though we don't necessarily perceive a change in pitch. Uh, so this is the reason you can play a middle C on a guitar and a middle C on a violin, and they sound quite different. Um, so you can basically think of sound as uh, kind of like a recipe. You start with a lot of the fundamental frequency, 
Uh, and then you add more and more higher frequencies uh, here and there, a little bit here and there, uh, until you end up with a sound with uh, a rich, complicated timbre. Uh, the other crucial part of a sound's timbre is known as its amplitude envelope. Uh, we don't have much time to talk about amplitude envelopes in detail today, uh, but amplitude envelopes are basically the way that the amplitude of a sound changes or evolves over time. Uh, and you can think of this as uh, maybe the difference between hitting a drum uh, and playing a smooth note on a flute. So we've just looked at the physical properties of sounds. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we actually need to do to represent sound within a computer. Uh, so we've seen that in the real world, the properties that define sound, such as pitch and amplitude, uh, are infinitely variable. Uh, so we can change them infinitesimally to produce a very, very slightly different in uh, our output sound. But computers are obviously digital machines. So before a sound can be stored within a computer, uh, it has to be broken down into a series of discrete steps. Um, to convert an audio signal from a real-world analog signal to a digital signal, uh, we use a, some sort of transducing machine like uh, a microphone. Now, what a microphone does uh, is it takes measurements of the amplitude of a sound as it changes over time, uh, which is a continuous real value, and it converts it to a voltage. Um, if the amplitude of this voltage is sampled at evenly spaced discrete intervals, uh, then we can store those values, those amplitude values, uh, in a floating point format within a computer. Uh, now, this representation is actually effectively the standard representation that we use uh, to represent sound in a computer, um, this series of samples, and we call this PCM, or pulse code modulation sound. Um, so effectively, in PCM audio, you've got a huge list of samples that were taken from points on a sound wave, um, and if you then have a speaker play back these samples at the same rate they were recorded, uh, you're going to get a, 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 a you're going to get a, a, a reproduction of the sound that was recorded initially. Um, so we obviously have to choose how often we take these samples, and we call this the sampling rate. Um, now, up to a point, the higher the sampling rate we use, uh, the more accurate the digital representation of our analog sound is going to be. Um, but then eventually, if our sampling rate moves high enough to a point that's around uh, 40,000 samples per second, um, then we can uh, effectively exactly reproduce um, the, uh, the uh, analog input signal um, from our set of digital samples. Um, the other main factor that governs the fidelity of digital audio um, is the resolution that we store the amplitude of each sample at. And this is effectively governed by uh, how many bits we assign to store each measurement of amplitude. And we call this the bit depth. Now, because we necessarily have uh, a limited number of bits in which to store each sample at each point in time, uh, we have to clamp each sample to uh, the closest discrete step that we can get. <coughs> so we've just seen that we can generate PCM audio using a microphone. Uh, we can also achieve the same result without using a microphone uh, by carefully producing a stream of samples algorithmically. Uh, and this is the process that we call sound synthesis. Uh, so as you can see, sound synthesis is uh, the process of producing an audio signal by means of applying an algorithm or performing a series of computations, uh, as opposed to simply reproducing an existing real world sound. So it's, it's creating a sound from scratch. Um, <clears throat> for example, uh, you could actually generate a synthesized sound by producing uh, samples of the amplitude of a sine wave changing over time, um, and this results in a sound that we call a sine tone. Now, sine tones are very interesting because the only frequency present uh, in the sound that's produced from one is the frequency of the sine wave that it was sampled from. Uh, so because there's only that fundamental frequency present, uh, these sounds have the most pure timbre. Uh, and here's what, a, here's what a sine tone sounds like. <coughs> uh, but instead of generating a sound from a sine wave, uh, there are also a few other very common waveforms that we use. Um, the simplest of these is probably the square wave, and you can see it on screen there. 
Um, so in a square wave, uh, the amplitude uh, of the wave alternates um, consistently between its maximum and minimum values with no smoothing in between. So we saw that the sine wave was smooth. Uh, a square wave alternates with no uh, smoothing. Uh, here's what it sounds like. <coughs> so you can hear square tones have uh, much more complicated timbre than sine tones. That's because there's additional high frequencies present. Um, and we're going to take a look shortly at uh, how we can generate one uh, using uh, iOS frameworks. Um, so now that we've seen a bit about how uh, physical sound, digital sound and sound synthesis works, um, let's take a quick look at the audio APIs that are available for us to use in iOS. Uh, so in iOS you've got two basic tiers of audio API. You've got uh, AV Foundation and the Audio Toolbox. Um, AV Foundation is a collection of relatively high level APIs uh, that we can use for creating and playing time-based media. Um, so as developers, when we need to play some audio in our apps, uh, we'll generally use an AV player from uh, the AV Foundation framework. <coughs> now AV, AV Foundation classes are great uh, because they tend to have uh, quite simple APIs um, that allow us to play and capture audio uh, without having to worry very much at all about what's going on under the hood. Um, the Audio Toolbox framework, on the other hand, uh, is actually a, a very low level interface um, to the audio subsystem that uh, provides interfaces for playing and recording audio uh, at a very raw uh, stream level or a sample level. Um, Finally, there's the hardware abstraction and driver layer, uh, which we don't have access to in iOS. So the lowest level framework that we have access to in iOS is uh, Audio Toolbox. Um, of most interest to us in building this synthesizer uh, is probably the audio unit class from Audio Toolbox. <coughs> so, uh, broadly speaking, audio units are components that can be chained together in a graph to generate, alter, or combine audio signals. Um, each of these audio units receives a buffer of audio data from somewhere. Uh, it could be input hardware such as a microphone, it could be from another audio unit, uh, or even a callback to your own code. Um, it then performs some work on this uh, raw audio data or these raw samples. Uh, maybe it would apply an effect like reverb and then it passes it on to the next unit in the graph. Um, an audio unit can potentially have uh, many inputs and many outputs, uh, which, which makes it possible to mix uh, multiple audio streams uh, into one output or vice versa. Um, now, the last audio unit in the graph uh, is generally either going to write the uh, audio stream to a file on disk, uh, or it's going to send it to the speakers for playback. Uh, so now let's take a look at how we can use these audio units to build our own simple synthesizer. Uh, I think probably the most interesting part of a software synthesizer uh, is probably the function callback that's uh, used to generate the raw audio samples themselves. And we call this the render function. So let's take a look at how the render function works. Um, our render function is a callback function. Um, that requests the next set of samples uh, to be played through the speakers. So you can think of this as working in a similar way to uh, how an off-screen graphics buffer works. Um, while the current buffer of audio data is being played, the render function is busy uh, generating the next buffer's worth of audio, uh, which is then going to be seamlessly swapped in uh, and sent to the speakers at the appropriate time. Um, this is what an audio unit render function callback uh, identifier kind of looks like. Um, so to set a render callback function on an audio unit, uh, the first thing you have to do is set its render callback struct. Uh, this is a C struct, and this struct has two fields. Uh, the first field is input proc, which is a function pointer to the render function. That's uh, the function that's actually going to be doing the work of generating the samples. Um, and uh, the second field is input proc refcon, uh, which is a pointer to uh, a context object that you can pass through so that your audio unit has some information about the context it's running in. Um, here's the render function declaration itself. Uh, 
Um, so you can see in that big list of parameters, um, you've got a reference to that context uh, object in RefCon. Um, you've got some flags, uh, the time at which the first frame of audio will actually be rendered by the speakers, uh, the bus number the audio is running on, and very importantly, the number of frames of audio that you have to generate in, in number frames. So that's the amount of samples that uh, Core Audio actually expects you to produce during that uh, render callback. Um, and finally, the uh, IO data struct, which is uh, a list of audio buffers. Um, and these buffers are where we actually write our uh, raw audio samples. <coughs> um, so this render callback function is going to be obviously called every time Core Audio needs some more audio samples to send to the speakers. Uh, to give you a sense of how quickly this happens, uh, just take a moment and imagine that you're rendering a graphic, uh, a graphical UI. Uh, at 60 frames per second, you've got about 17 milliseconds to render a screen's worth of pixels for uh, each frame of graphics. Now, CD quality audio actually runs at a sample rate of about 44,000 samples per second, uh, which means you have about 22 microseconds to generate each frame of audio. Uh, and if you miss one of these frames, you're probably going to notice a glitch in the audio. Uh, now, the obvious solution to this is to introduce some sort of buffering system. Uh, so maybe instead of generating one frame of audio every 22 microseconds, uh, you might decide to generate 1,000 frames of audio every 22 milliseconds. Uh, now, this is obviously going to be much more feasible, um, but it can greatly increase the severity of the consequences of what happens uh, if you aren't able to uh, render the amount of samples that you need during that callback. Um, so while uh, you're probably not going to notice if you drop a single frame of video at 60 frames per second, um, if you have an audio glitch that lasts for 22 milliseconds, uh, this is going to be very noticeable and probably very annoying. Uh, so obviously, we can ramp the buffer time up uh, quite a lot more than this uh, to try and overcome this problem. Um, but this is obviously going to introduce some latency uh, into our sound synthesizer. So with audio, it's basically always a trade-off between uh, reducing input latency um, and decreasing the risk of uh, the render callback function not being able to produce the amount of samples that it needs uh, by the appropriate time. Um, and obviously, because the, render fun because the render callback function is so uh, time critical, uh, you can't do anything during a render callback function that's slow or asynchronous. For example, you can't, um, uh, you can't use a network connection and you can't allocate memory. You can't do anything like that. Uh, so we've seen most of the basic building blocks that we need to actually generate some sound. Uh, so let's move over to Xcode and uh, take a look at uh, some of the classes that we'll use uh, to build our synthesizer. <coughs> uh, all right, so... Uh, We've got a little bit of time left uh, to take a very quick look through this uh, Xcode project. Uh, this is a very simple example of how we can um, generate a raw stream of samples uh, for sending to the speaker uh, using audio units. Um, <coughs> so I've implemented the entirety of this code in the app delegate, uh, just for the purposes of this talk, so it's all in the one place. Uh, the first thing I'm doing is importing the AV Foundation framework. Uh, this is so we have access to the uh, AV Audio Session uh, singleton. Um, and I'm also importing the Audio Toolbox uh, headers so that we uh, have access to uh, the Audio Unit headers. Um, here I'm defining... Uh, uh, a number of variables. I have uh, an audio component instance, which is going to be a reference to our actual audio unit. Um, and I have some parameters uh, that we'll set, and we'll see where they're set shortly. Uh, next up, uh, you'll see this render tone function. And you may remember that this, uh, this function prototype here uh, matches the uh, render callback function that iOS uh, audio units use. Um, so this is the function that 
we're going to actually generate our samples in. Um, we'll skip over this for the moment and come back to it in a tick. We'll just look how everything else is set up first. Um, so we're an application did finish launching with options here. We're setting our sample rate to 44.1K, which is standard uh, CD quality audio sampling rate. We're setting our frequency to uh, 440 hertz. Um, setting our amplitude to one. Now, in the type of audio that we're going to be dealing with today and in general digital audio, uh, amplitudes are usually clamped between uh, zero and one, with zero being no sound output or no loudness and one being 100% volume or maximum loudness. And as a general rule, if you increase your amplitude over um, a value of one, uh, you'll end up with clipping or distortion in your sound. <coughs> I might just make this. All right, there we go, that's better. Um, all right, so the first thing we're doing here is on our global uh, audio session. Um, we're setting its category to audio session uh, category playback. Um, and on that audio session also uh, s uh, saying that it should be set to active. Uh, now what setting the uh, category to playback does is if you have another app um, uh, that's running in a background audio mode such as Spotify playing some music, um, Setting the category of your app to uh, playback is going to ensure that um, when it starts generating audio, uh, that it hijacks the global audio session from Spotify. So it says, all right, Spotify needs to stop playing now, um, and now our app has control of uh, the sound that's played back through the speakers. Uh, the next thing we're going to do here is generate uh, an audio component description. Um, and the most important parameter we've set here is we've set this uh, audio unit type to output. Um, we're going to use this audio component description, uh, sorry, so what this audio component description does is it, it describes a type of audio component or a type of audio unit. Um, so we're saying here uh, we want uh, the type of audio unit that sends output to the speakers. Um, and we get one here by calling this audio toolbox function, audio component find next, and passing in our component description. And what this function does is um, it uh, iterates through the existing list of system audio units until it finds one that closely matches the description we pass in. Uh, so this is going to iterate through the system audio units. It's going to find the output unit um, and give us a reference to it. Um, and then down here on line 75, uh, we're going to instantiate a new instance of that output, output unit. So at this point, um, our uh, audio unit variable that we declared earlier uh, is going to be instantiated with, um, with uh, a type of audio unit that can send data to the speakers. Uh, here we're going to define, we're going to describe our render callback function using the uh, render callback struct type that we saw earlier. Um, we're going to set its input proc um, or its actual render callback function pointer to the render tone function that we defined uh, earlier. And we're going to set its context object to null, so we're not going to pass any context through. Um, we'll call audio unit set property uh, on our audio unit. Um, we'll tell it that the type of property we want to set is its render callback, um, and we'll pass through a reference to that render callback struct. Uh, now, the thing with audio units is, uh, as a general rule, when you want to set a property on an audio unit, uh, you'll usually do it through uh, audio unit set property and then uh, passing through a reference to the audio unit that you want the property set on, the type of property that you want set, and the value that you want the property set to. Um, then we create an audio stream basic description, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Uh, so with audio, similar to with um, computer graphics, where you can have a lot of different image formats that essentially represent the same thing. Uh, so you know, JPEG, PNG, GIF, etc., um, all represent pixels on a screen. Uh, you can have a lot of different types of audio formats. Uh, and what we're setting up here is. Uh, 
uh, just the standard properties to describe the type of audio that we're creating, uh, as we discussed earlier. Uh, we're running a bit short on time, so I'm going to uh, buzz through these next bits. We're going to call uh, audio unit initialize and audio unit output start. Um, and what this will effectively do is tell core audio that uh, our audio unit is uh, ready to begin generating audio. So as we saw earlier, when an audio unit is ready to begin generating audio, its uh, render callback function will be called to produce some samples. So the next thing we're going to see is that our render tone function is going to be called. Uh, it, and importantly, it's going to tell us um, how many samples or frames of audio we're expected to generate and where we're expected to put them. Uh, the first thing I've defined here is um, the amount of samples per period of audio. So remember that uh, sound waves are generally periodic functions in the sense that they repeat uh, over a fixed period. Um, I've defined this to be a uh, sample rate divided by frequency. Um, and this is effectively, um, uh, f so because we're generating a square tone, which remember is uh, a series of high values followed immediately by a series of low values, um, this is how many samples of audio we should generate per um, oscillation of that square wave. Um, if we increase frequency, uh, it'll have the effect of uh, increasing the frequency of the oscillation. It's going to produce a higher tone. Similarly, if we decrease the frequency, it stretches out the wavelength uh, and we produce a lower tone. Uh, this for loop here is going to be where uh, the real body of the synthesis work happens. Um, so we're going to loop through um, uh, from zero to the number of samples that we're expected to generate. Uh, we'll set our channel to zero for mono audio get a reference to uh, our buffer of float 32s. So this is the array that we're actually expected to put the samples in. Um, and here is where we actually generate and write the raw samples. So we defined this property theta earlier to be equal to zero, so it begins at zero. And I'm using theta here to describe uh, the position through the, the uh, current cycle of the waveform that we're at. Um, Theta is advanced by one uh, each time we generate a new sample. And if we've already generated an entire sample's worth of, uh, sorry, an entire waveform's worth of samples, we reset theta back to zero here. And so to generate our square wave, um, what we do is we check if theta is greater than, uh, so remember with a square wave, there's two parts of the waveform. There's a high part and then immediately a low part, and this is repeated indefinitely. Uh, so we're checking if we're in the first half of that waveform or the second half. If we're in the first half, we set uh, a uh, positive amplitude value, so we send one as all the samples. Uh, similarly, if we're in the second half, we set that uh, negative uh, amplitude value. Um, and if we run this, And I unlock my phone. Uh, we'll hear that. Uh, we'll hear that uh, simple square tone being generated. Um, now, obviously, we could extend this code to. Um, uh, generate more complicated waveforms by using different, uh, different, uh, I guess, wave structures to generate that sound. Uh, we could also um, increase this. We, sorry, we could uh, we could change this uh, simple example to uh, produce more interesting sounds. Also, by uh, providing a user interface and allowing people to change, you know, frequency, amplitude, uh, and to also, with iOS, very interesting, we can allow people to change those in very uh, interesting ways. So we could, for example, map frequency to a gyroscope parameter um, and have the frequency of our sound change in real time uh, and be generated in real time based on uh, device motion, for example, which is very interesting, I think. Um, so uh, that's uh, how to build probably the simplest synthesizer you can using uh, iOS. Uh, thanks for coming and listening. Uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference.